Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Steve Peters, and this afternoon I'm going to be interviewing Peter Lang. Peter Lang served the city of St. Thomas for over 54 years as both a mayor, a member of the city council, and also on the hospital board. Pete, I'd like to welcome you out this afternoon. Thank and you, I look Steve. forward to hearing of your reminiscences about your life in St. Thomas. Pete, you weren't, you're not originally from St. Thomas, so you were born in 1903 in Scotland. How did your family come to uh, settle in St. Thomas? Well, Steve, that's right. I was born October the 16th, 1903, in the town of Bathgate in Linlithgowshire, Scotland. That was Mary, Queen of Scots country, if you know history. My dad was a coal miner. What was your father and mother's name? Uh, my father's name was Peter. My mother's name was Martha. And there was, I am the oldest of 12 children, six boys and six girls, born to Peter and Martha Lang. We lived in this town called Bathgate in between Edinburgh and Glasgow. And it was a town famous. It had a famous man born there. It was Sir James Young Simpson. Now, who was Sir James Young Simpson? Sir James Young Simpson was a doctor who discovered chloroform. He saw a Highland woman give birth to a baby and severe pain and terrible pain. And he said, this shouldn't be. So he studied and studied and he studied in a cup with chloroform. And he used to bring the medical people in from Edinburgh, which was a great medical center in those days. And they used to come into Bathgate. They'd sit around the table and he'd chloroform them. <laughs> and then, then he'd have to wake them up. And uh, so Sir James Young Simpson was credited as the discoverer of chloroform. And when I was in Edinburgh a year or two ago, I, the bus driver said to me, he said, where were you born? I said, Bathgate. Well, he said, I'll show you a man that was born in Bathgate. We come up to this beautiful statue in the middle of Edinburgh of Sir James Young Simpson, the man who discovered chloroform. Do you know, it's quite a story. The Scottish church at that time severely uh, criticized him. They said, you know, the Bible says that women should bear children in suffering and travail. And they said, you're violating the biblical law. Yes, Simpson said that's true, but he said it also says in the Bible that when God created Eve, he cast a deep spell over Adam and brought one of his ribs and created Eve. Now he said, that's all I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> that's the story. We sailed from Scotland in 1912. Do you remember the name of the ship? Yes, the Royal Allen Liner Hesperian. Just that same month, the White Star Liner Titanic had sailed. It had struck an iceberg in the North Atlantic and went down with a great loss of life. We sailed on the Royal Allen Liner Hesperian that same month of July, and we ran over an iceberg, over the top of the iceberg. There was no iceberg watch in the North Atlantic until later on. However, we reversed the engines and came off that iceberg and went on to Father's Point and landed in Canada. And what, once you arrived in Canada, how did you, your family or your father choose to come to St. Thomas? Well, there was a family by the name of Ritchie who had lived in Bathgate, and they had come to Canada uh, some years before. And my father was a coal miner, and he was always on strike, always on strike. And, they, and you know, I went back to Scotland 50-odd years later, and the miners were still on strike. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, my uncle John Hume came to this country first, and uh, he, he worked down for the timber man down in Ottawa, a big timber man, I've forgotten his name, and uh, went out to Seattle and Tacoma. And he said, you're foolish. He came home to Scotland, he said, you're foolish. He said, there's a great land across the sea there. There's lots of work for everybody, better living. So we listened to him, 
We saved our money and we came, we sailed in 19 and 12 and we came out and um, as I say, Tom Ritchie and his family were in Yarmouth Heights at that time. And we came out there and we came into the station on the Wabash down on Flores Street and the old granny, that was the train that brought in the immigrants. The old granny was a famous train and it brought in Irish and Scotch and English immigrants. And they went down into the Flores Street station. Tom Ritchie met us with the horse and the Democrat. We piled into the Democrat and we rode down through the streets of St. Thomas out to the Yarmouth Heights and we lived there for some years. Whereabouts in the Heights? Yarmouth Heights, out on the uh, right, there was a, we, we lived right on Talbot Street in yes. the Heights. There was a cement block house there and uh, it's, it's gone, it's been took, taken down now. But we lived in that. Right across, just a little ways up from the Talbot Golf Course. Okay, on the south side of the road. On the south side, yeah. Yes. And you know, that golf course was still a golf course in 19 and 12. And a man, a Scotsman, by the name of Bob Gray, ran that golf course. And it's still a golf course yes. today. Yeah. And uh, on a Hogmanay, which was New Year's Day, a great day in Scotland, we used to go to the golf course They'd have dances and singing, and Scotch dancing and singing and all that. And we'd eat the haggis and carry on. <laughs> <laughs> well, what time of year was it that you arrived in St. Thomas? Like, which in, season? It, it was uh, in, in uh, the summer time. The summer? Yes, we, we came in. My uh, people came in and they, they lived on 20, at 20 Weldon Avenue first. And my grandmother lived around the corner at 20 Woodworth Avenue. And uh, that's where we landed. When, uh, when after you arrived in St. Thomas, you were about nine years old. That's right. Did you, did you enter into school that fall? Yes. What school did you attend? I attended Myrtle Street School for a little time, and then we came over to the north side. And we lived on the north side the most of our lives. And uh, I went to Balaclava Street School. Um, Jesse Lowe and Sophie Nash uh, were some of the teachers that I remember there. Was there a lot of, most of the students attending Balaclava Street School, were their parents, did their parents work on the railways or? Most of them. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, everybody worked on the railroads in those days. Yes. How long uh, did you, did you complete your education or did you through, go to work? Through the public school and at 12 years I, I had to quit and go to work. And I went to work at the Erie Ironworks. Where with, was it located at, at the time? At the West End. Complete West End. At the corner of, of, of church, church and Talbot? Up there, yes. Yes. I went there and worked for five cents an hour. <laughs> five cents an hour at the Erie Ironworks. And uh, there was a the fellow by the name of George Fickling. We used to make these wheelbarrows. And of course, George used to cut them out, pattern them, cut them out. And I used to sit on a stool and held them while he spot welded them. Now today, they have a press and they press the whole wheelbarrow out in one piece. But in those days, they, they cut it out of plate. And I held the plate while George Frickling spot welded it. Were there no uh, child labor laws at that time? Or was it, were you working illegally as a 12 year old? No, there was no, no laws that I know of at that time, no. Well, how come you had to quit school and go to work? Did you, you well, to provide had, for your family? We had a big family, yes, we had a big family. And uh, my dad was a coal miner, and he went to work on the railroads. Which railroad did he work Michigan for? Central, the Michigan Central Railroad. The old Canada Southern, as it was called. In the, was he in the shops? Working? Yes, he was in the shops. He ran the steam hammer in the blacksmith shop <laughs> under Jerry Rowland, who was the foreman. And the steam hammer, they used to bring these great side rods, white heat, out of the furnace bring them over to the steam hammer and the big steam hammer used to come down, it used to shake the whole shop and they'd fashion the, fashion the rods out to see in, in the white heat. Sounds interesting. Yes, it was. Um, after, after Erie Iron Works, where did you go to work? I went to the Michigan Central. To the oh, railroad. so you worked, uh, you left, you started with the railway in 1919? 1918. 1918. 1918, yes. 
went to the railroads. And you know, the day I started, a fellow said to me, and I can't remember who it was, he said, you know, this town will be a flag stop one of these days. I said, what do you mean? There'll be no trains, no engines, no cars. And I looked at the fellow in amazement, and yet we've lived to see it. Yes. <laughs> yes, we certainly made a tr real transition in yeah, St. That's, Thomas that's from right. the railways to industry. That's right. What was life like as a as a twelve year old in St. Thomas? What what did you do for amusement at that time? Well, we played soccer football. That was one of the things we did in the summertime. Where where was the pitch that you played on? On down in the athletic park in Woodworth Avenue. They had a the Woodworth Rovers played on Woodworth Avenue. Is that the old man farm there? The old man farm is right. That's right, Steve. That's where we played our foot our soccer football. We had a what we, the, the Woodworth Rovers played there, uh, Harry Latham, Al Fallman, and all those fellows, I knew them well. And we formed what we called the Junior Rovers. We, we used to go out and kick in as kids. And you know, we, the, the London and District, they called a meeting one time. Peculiar enough, it was a fellow by the name of Haggis, Haggis, <laughs> an Englishman, who called this meeting. And I went over there, and we had two teams, two, two junior teams in St. Thomas. Uh, we had the Junior Rovers, they were under 21, all under 21, and we had the, uh, the Legion, the, uh, what did they call them, the, uh, the Legion, I think that, they yeah, the, the Legion. And uh, they, uh, so I went over, when this fellow Haggis called the meeting, and I said, why not organize a London and District Junior Football League? I said, we've got two teams in St. Thomas. Maybe you could get three or four or five in London. So they got four in London. There were six teams. And that formed the London and District uh, Junior uh, Soccer Teams. And you know, we established a Canadian record, the Junior Rovers. We played 84 games without a defeat. Boy, oh boy, that is a, a great defeat. record. And uh, uh, Bissett, Billy Bissett, was the sports editor of the Free Press. And he wrote us up, and he said, uh, put our picture in there. And he said, this is a Canadian record. I don't think it's ever been beaten. It'd be interesting to find out if yeah, it has been. Yeah, that's right. Well, the man property, um, circuses used to be held that's there, right. didn't they? That's right. That's right. The circuses used to come in there at the man property. And uh, they used to, there was a, there was a spring out in the bank of the creek, out past First Avenue. In the, behind Timken? In behind, uh, across the road from oh, Timken. Oh, behind the Sophie yeah. Siegel yeah, scrapyard. in there. And uh, this was beautiful water. There was a spring and it ran up to Inkerman Street, and there was a pump there, pump and a tub. And when the circuses used to come in at the bottom of Inkerman Street, they'd bring the elephants up and water them at this pump. Really? <laughs> yes. And uh, so we used to, we, when where I, li I lived, my family had their house on Trafalgar Street, and we could see the circuses as they came in, you see. And uh, I used, we used to go down and unload them, help unload them. The, the trains that came in, were they really highly decorated? Oh, the, yes. Ringling Brothers, uh, Barnum and Bailey, they were all decorated up. Yeah. Then, of course, they used to have circus parades. And they'd bring the elephants and have a big parade down the street and beautiful girls sitting on the top of the elephant's head and, you know, and <laughs> tights and all this. Oh, yes, they were. <laughs> it was uh, quite a show. Well, when the circus came to town, was and let's say it, they, the circus arrived during the week and school was on, would, would school be canceled so the children could attend the circus? No, not, not very often, not very often, no. <laughs> I bet you there was a lot of hooky played, though, uh, during those times. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there was. <laughs> well, growing up in the East End, um, we, we had the Canada Iron Foundry. What, who, who was working in the foundry at that time? Were, were these people that didn't want to work on the railways or did, were immigrants brought in to work? There were immigrants brought in. They had a great big building, big black building with a, a veranda running around the top of it. Where was this building? This was at the top 
across the road in the Devil's Half Acre, on on the, on the uh, right across from Woodworth Avenue. Uh, Coleman had his junkyard at, at Woodworth Avenue, <laughs> and uh, right across was the, the Devil's Half Acre, and there was this great big hotel with a veranda running around the top, and that's where they brought these Polish, Polish people in to, to work in the foundry. Really? Yeah. The Devil's Half Acre, just for your information, was a half acre piece of property that was located on the south side of Talbot Street. That's right. And it was originally built as the Canada Southern Hotel. Yeah. That was the original name for it. And the gentleman that owned, when the hotel was built, it was in Yarmouth Township. And when the city of St. Thomas annexed some land in 1871, that was, that was the old Millersburg, was annexed Millersburg, into the city. That's right. This gentleman didn't want to become part of the city, and it was approximately a half acre of land that remained in the township, and it became known as the Devil's Half Acre. Devil's Half Acre. It was finally annexed by the city, I think, about 1913. It became part of the city, but it's an interesting uh, name for a hotel. Well, you see, the, the, uh, the railway used to run their cars under the Devil's Half Acre right there, and they'd shunt them back and forth and when they made up their trains. And... Uh, it was, of course, you see, that East End was a disaster area. It had this dirty, filthy old foundry, uh, uh, Cullman's junkyard, the uh, Devil's Saf Acre there. The, uh, it was a disaster area, mm -hmm. you see. <laughs> um, I've, heard it, I've heard the East End of St. Thomas referred to as Little Russia. Have you ever heard <laughs> that name given to the yes, area? Yes, that's right. Oh, they, there was lots of foreigners came in there, Russians too, came into there. We lived on Arthur Avenue for years, and in through there was people, you know, foreign people. There were foreigners, Russians, Poles and that, but they were friendly. They were friendly people. They, they wanted to do, live and be Canadians, yes. you know. Yes, they, they were friendly people. Oh, I knew a lot of them there. Well, I've heard a, a, a name, George F. Shepard. Who was George Shepard? Oh, Shepard, yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> there was a Fred Shepard who was a communist. <laughs> well, I knew Fred lived down in Sparta. Sparta, yes. Yeah, he just passed away last he, year. He was a communist, out and out. <laughs> and uh, He was an interesting man. He was a hermit. Very, very he lived, hermit. lived, lived in the woods himself. south of uh, Sparta, and that's he right. had his own little forest. And, that's uh, right, that's right. Interesting man. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so how was George Shepard related to Fred? I, I really don't know, to tell you the truth. I don't know. Oh. I knew Fred Shepard, of course, very well, and, and he was an out-and-out -out red. <laughs> did, did uh, just kind of, we'll be jumping ahead a little bit, but um, I've heard uh, Fred Shepard, uh, he talked of uh, different meetings that took place in the old brewery skeleton. Oh. Do you ever, did you ever hear of any communist meetings actually taking place in St. Thomas? Well, there was. They, there, <laughs> yes, there, there was. And uh, the, uh, we called it the brewery skeleton. It stood there for a long time. Just to enter, the brewery skeleton was uh, where Carriage Chev Olds is today. Yeah. It was built, it was supposed to be a brewery. It was built by a family named Col Kolb, K-L-O-B, in Be 1929. That's right. And what it was for, really, was to ship beer to the United States. The yeah. states were in a state of prohibition. That's right. But prohibition ended in 1933 in the United States, and the brewery was never completed. Never and it completed. It was, uh, I guess, a landmark to St. Thomas into the 1960s. For years, for years, yes. I think Rankin, didn't Rankin buy it and tear it down? Or? Must have been quite a job tearing yeah. that building Bert, down. Oh, it was. Burt Rankin, I think. Yeah. But the... The communists did did have a meeting in St. Oh, Thomas. Oh yes, I can remember. <laughs> you know, the city hall. Uh, they there was meetings held in the city hall every day, Sundays every day, and they never charged them for meetings. And they used to there used to be. I can remember when there was two Mounties used to sit up in the balcony there at the city hall and listen to the meetings, you know, Boy. because <laughs> watching for the communists. Of course, communism was a dread thing in those days. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Bolshevism. <laughs> well, just to, uh, what about uh, the piggery? What was the piggery? Oh, <laughs> well, the piggery, see, there was, there was two piggeries. There was the piggery, uh, uh, 
wait a minute, I'll get this name, out on on, on the road to uh, to uh, Elmer. That was Penn Hales? Penn Hales yes. Piggery, that's right. And then on the way down, there was McManus's Piggery, see? And they used to bring, they used to bring the pigs into the top of Inkerman Street, and then they would ship them away by truck and down to Penn Hills, out to Penn Hills and down to McManus's for the slaughter of them, you see. Really? <laughs> yeah. Well, grow, what else did you do in St. Did you go, did you go to movies? Did you, was oh, yes. there dances held in town for the, like what was it like as a, as a young person, a teenager growing up in St. Thomas in, in the teens? Well, you see, there was the Duncan Opera House they had road shows on there, you know. I can remember going there as a boy with my brother Bob, who is dead now, but uh, we went there, and of course they had a chorus line, you know, and uh, it had come out one time, I can remember it so well, they had looking glasses, you see, and the spotlight showed on them, and they flashed these in your eyes, and they sang, I've got my eye on you, it's jolly good scenery too, I wish I could be where I could see everything that you do. And of course, well, we won a sleigh. They had prizes given, and my brother and I, Bob, won a sleigh, and we hauled it home from the, from the old Duncan Opera House. Well, you know, there's an interesting story there. You remember uh, the St. Thomas man that went to Hollywood? Ned Sparks. Ned Sparks. Or Sparkman, as his... Sparkman, that's right. I knew his his family. They lived on Elgin Street, didn't That's they? That's right. Well, Ned Sparks, you know, was a sarcastic, uncouth sort of a fellow, you know. And uh, <coughs> I worked with Frank Lorden. He was a Roman Catholic and he was a strong fellow. He was in the United States Navy that went around the world in 1910. And uh, he came out of the Navy and he worked in the, in the shops. Well, <coughs> Ned Sparks he had a, f a son, a uh, brother called Jerry. Jerry, uh, Jerry, uh, uh, Frank uh, Lorden, Jerry Lorden. And Nell Lorden was his sister. Nell Lorden was appointed the, by Mackenzie King to look after pensions. She, she was given the job to look after the old age pensions. I'll tell you a story about that. Anyway, uh, they, uh, uh, Jerry, Ned Sparks got a gang, and he was going to, they were going to jump on Jerry Lorden. And Frank got wind of it, you see, and Frank went down. And of course, the old uh, streetcars used to line up at the Duncan Opera House, the old ones with the, with the wheels in the middle. They used to <laughs> walk up and down, you know. They'd, be on the wire, you know, mm -hmm. and the thing would come off the wire, see the sparks. And uh, anyway, they were coming out, and Nard Sparks was laying with a gang of toughs, and they were going to get Jerry Lorden. But Frank heard about it, and Frank was down there. So Jerry was there, and of course, when they come to take a, take a, when they come out of the old Duncan Opera House, the old streetcars are waiting. The bobtails, as they call them, they were waiting, and uh, here, of course, uh, Sparks's gang moved in on Jerry, but Frank moved on, and, and he hit Ned Sparks on really? the chin, <laughs> and he knocked him back, and he landed between the bobtails' cars and hit his head on the rail. Oh boy! And we we went down. Uh, the, there was a, a barber shop. What was the name of it? I've forgotten the name. And we went down. We thought we'd killed him. They thought they'd killed him, you know. And <laughs> somebody said to Frank Lorden, my God, Frank, you've killed him. <laughs> and he hit his head in between the, the bobtailed cars, you know. But anyway, he... Was he a famous movie star at that time? No, that was when he... Well, he, that's when he... Before he went to Hollywood. Before he went to Hollywood. Before he went to Hollywood. Another famous person that was uh, lived in St. Thomas was a baseball umpire named Bob Emsley. Bob Emsley? Do you remember Bob Emsley? Oh, crabby Bob Emsley, yes. I knew him well. 
He was a regular old crab, you know. <laughs> yes, I knew him. Did he stay well. active in anyway, baseball in St. Thomas yes, after he retired? Yes, from yes the, he did. He was a National League umpire. Yes, he was, and he had a son, you know. He had a young son, and he married a, a lovely girl and lived in St. Thomas. They lived in St. Thomas. Uh, Emsley, uh, Emsley Field. Emsley Field, that's, that's right. That's right, yes. He um, was an old crab. Though. Was he? <laughs> <laughs> fight with him, you'd fight with him every day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a colorful character um, that once sat on city council, and for a number of years we thought he served longer than you, but with careful checking we saw that you served longer. His name was Pat Meehan. Oh, yes. Do you remember Pat Meehan? I remember Pat well. He used to wear a, had a frock coat on, you know, split tails, you know. And I can remember him, of course. He was an old man. He well, he to... passed away, I think, about 1926 or yes, 29. Yes, yes. And I can remember him going down. Of course, Pat, I think, only served about, I don't think he served 40 years. It was about 36 years yes, that he served. Yeah. He See, ran for council every oh, year, but he wasn't oh, yes. always elected. No, no, I know, I know. Uh, I know I knew Pat well. And I knew his whole family. See, they had two twins. They had uh, Pat and Mike. <laughs> they had a, uh, the Meehan's had a shoe store. Me and in Regan shoe uh, store. Me and in Regan shoe store, yes. I knew me and in Regan there. You know, there was another store there, and that's just next door. And well, me and in Regan, they were on Talbot, just around, just a little west of Coffee's. That's weren't they? right. And then there was another one in there, where the, and they sold all railroad overalls and all that. What was his name? I knew it well. And you know, there used to be the two dairies around the corner, the, Western the city dairy. and the Western Dairy. And you know, when I used to leave the city hall about midnight, gee, there'd be big rats that long running in front of the, along the lane there, running ahead of the car, ahead of the headlights, you know. Oh, boy. But when you'd go into, uh, into this, I can't think, can't get his name, you'd go and you'd lean over the counter, you should see these big rats running behind the counter. <laughs> of course, they were, they were, it was the dairies. <laughs> boy, oh, boy. Well... Well, go back to your employment with the, with the railroad. When you started with the railroad, it was the Michigan Central. Michigan Central. And you went to work in the shops? Yes, yes. And what, was, what did you do in the shops? Believe it or not, I was a nut threader. A nut threader. I was a nut threader. They had a, a machine with an apron around it and that compound, you know, that cutting compound. And they had these uh, taps, taps sticking up. And they had these blank nuts, blank nuts, uh, just, they, in fact, they made them in the blacksmith shop down there, Jerry Rowland and the blacksmith. Well, they'd bring them in in a barrel, you know, and I'd run them on these taps and put a thread on them, make the tapping nuts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How many people worked in those shops, Peter? Oh, every man and his brother. I have a picture that long taken there in the 20s and the hundreds of men working. Well, I've heard the shop. there was. I've heard figures in the neighborhood of four thousand people oh, there working was for the all of that. For all the of Michigan that. Central. And of course, there was the PM too. Yes, plus. See, and plus the, the Wabash. Wabash. Yes. So you know, there's. See, there was. Well, that's really something for St. Thomas to be well, the divisional point. Have yeah. three ra three roundhouses right. in that's, it, and that's right. three that's, shops. That's right. Yes, that's right. I I worked in the, in the old PM for <laughs> for years too. You know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, um, with, the, with the railway, and this is, we're kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but uh, we, we'll come back to it, uh, the railway again. How did uh, the dieselization affect the shops? Like you, you saw it when you yes. started with the railway, you were working on steam, steam engines, engines. And then in the late 40s, early 50s, the came the, was the coming of the diesels. The 40s, early, early 40s. Early the 40s? The diesels came, yeah. Did that, uh, dis were a lot of people laid off in the shops oh, because of that? Yes, absolutely. You see, the, the diesel is like a car. You run it in, you got a part there, you just shove it on. In the old steamers, you know, I ran a, a, a big wheel lathe, I turned wheels, and I ran a, a lathe there for, uh, uh, you know, to, to shaping things. We made everything that ran the old steam engines, even the side rods. Jerry Rowland in his blacksmith shop bring these white hot out, beat them into shape on the steam hammer. My dad ran the steam hammer. And we, we, fit, we then we put them in the mill and mill them out and shape them, see? Then when the diesels came, 
Well, the diesels just came in, you took a part off, put another part off. Right. Already right. made. <laughs> how, uh, how many engines could, were, could be repaired at any one time in, in, say, the Michigan Central shops, the building that's still standing? Well, they had the, uh, they had the one side was a strip side where they stripped the engines down. The other side was when they put the pieces back on, you see. And then, of course, the roundhouse was there. You see, and quite often, you know, they, they, they work for piecework, a lot of this stuff, you know, and on time. And uh, we, we, that was an awful thing, that piecework. You know, I used to see men stealing, you know, they'd, they'd, they'd uh, men in the Salvation Army, you know, they'd get out in the street and pray or, or pray by the anvil, and then they'd, they'd mark their card and, and, and steal on the card, you know. <laughs> so, so those were the piecework made made a lot of crooks, made a mm -hmm. lot of crooks. But the unions knocked it out. They, well, when did when did the unions come into the? When you started with the railway, were the unions already in place? Oh yes, yes, the unions were there. I, I belong to the International Association of Machinists, and now they have aerospace workers on it. But I was a, fifty years. I had. I've got a. You're a life member of that I'm union. I'm a life aren't you? member of that union. I, I've got a. A gold certificate, gold certificate, uh, 50 years in the International Association of Machinists. And you retired from the railway in 1968? 68, 68, after 50 years. Boy, that's quite a service. It's quite a long service. Um, Peter, you were always interested in, in athletics. That's Just, right. Just uh, tell us a bit. I know you were involved in wrestling, and you've already mentioned your football and soccer interest, right. and you were involved in boxing. Um, and I think we have a picture of, of Peter in the... Yeah. <laughs> is that in the boxing outfit? Yeah. And if, uh, if we could get that on him and show, show Peter in fine form a number of years ago. Well, can you tell us a bit about your athletic career? Well, you see, the, uh, uh, when the men went into the war and came back right after the 20s, after the First World War, see, boxing was mandatory uh, in the... They had the inter-allied championships and all that uh, in, in England, in these places where the men were, so that it was mandatory. So when the men came back, the soldiers came back from Civvy Street, they were, a lot of them had boxed, you see. I was a young gaffer. I was about 20 years old or something like that. And uh, they formed the, what they called the London Garrison Championships. Now these was practically the Ontario Championships and they held them in the armories in London. And these, all the regiments, the Royal Canadian Regiments, the 12th Battery, the Western Ontario Regiment, all these Elgin Regiment, and I boxed for the Elgin Regiment, although I, I never attended a drill on the Elgin Regiment. But anyway, they had these boxing championships. So I entered right after the 20s and in the London armories, and uh, I went into the featherweight, 126 pounds. I knocked every man out and went into the ring. <laughs> so <laughs> the next year, I went into the, into the lightweight, which was 134, 35. And I knocked everyone out there, believe it or not. Boy. The third year that I came, they wouldn't let me enter. <laughs> so Charlie Watling, incidentally, was looking after me at that time. He said, you can't buy them. This is an amateur athletic association. Well, he said, if, if Lang enters, nobody will enter against him. I'd scored knockouts all the way. So you know what they did? They brought a fella from the Elks Athletic Club in Toronto by the name of Billy Putwain. Putwain had been, came back from Philadelphia in Madison Square Garden, New York. He'd won the Golden Gloves Championships. And they brought him in, believe it or not, and they put me on as a special boat with Putwain. And it's quite a story. Of course, I was a slam-bang fighter patterned after Dempsey, you know. And uh, there was an old chap by the name of Alec Compton. He was an old boxer, and the Elgin Regiment brought him in. And this day, this night, when the Garrison Championships were on, uh, they... The third, yes, he's, he, he was in my corner. He'd never seen me fight before. So, of course, he said, 
Oh, no, go out, take it easy, feel him out, you know, the old baloney. Well, that wasn't my style. I used to rush out, bang, 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 till somebody went down. But I fiddled around, a little bit, and just through the second round, I said, if I don't get going, I'm going to lose this fight. And I started, but it was too late. I lost the decision. <laughs> so, <laughs> Did you, uh, you were also a wrestler, too? Oh, yes. I was wrestling champion of Ontario. I won that in 19 and 23. They, I went down to Toronto, to the West End Y, Toronto. And uh, there was a man by the name of Gordon Osborne, who was the champion of Canada, incidentally, 123 pounds. He was a streetcar conductor in the city of Toronto, about 30 years old. And I, I was 16. <laughs> and uh, so I wrestled Gordon Osborne, and he beat me on a decision, couldn't throw me. Four years later, I went back and took the title away from him. Did you really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's something. <laughs> what, uh, what made you decide to get involved in, in local politics? Well, we go back to 1933. The Great Depression, the world was in the throes of a Great Depression. The municipalities were hard hit. We had plenty of people on relief. They called it relief in those days. And they didn't know what to do. Municipalities had no money to, to feed these people. And jobs, thousands of men were laid off. and. Uh, there was no work for them. So there was a group of merchants, four merchants from the East End came to see me. Who were, what were their names? Do well, remember? there was Max Cullman. He was the scrap dealer. He was the Jew who was a, he was a wonderful man. You know, he could talk eight, seven or eight languages. Yeah. And they used to bring him into the court as an interpreter, you know. <laughs> there was a fellow by the name of uh, Bill uh, Mason, what did Bill mean? Bill had a truck, and he uh, he trucked for the for the iron foundry, and uh, there was Jim. Uh, uh, who was the other fella? Uh, <laughs> he had a horse and a dray, and he pulled all the sand uh, for me. And there was uh, a fella who ran a, a station. A, 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 there was these four men, and they came to my house on Arthur Avenue, and they said, look, they said, this East End is in an awful shape. We want somebody to go in there and do something for us. Well, just let me know, yeah. was the city, how did the city elect the aldermen at that time? Was there, a, were, was there wards, or was everybody elected at large? At large. Everybody was elected at large. There was the ward system, it had ward system, but it had gone out. I see. It had gone out, and they elected from the whole city. And uh, so anyway, they, that group, those four businessmen, went up the street to where Ernie Duckworth lived. And they said to Ernie, we want you to run. We've been down to see Pete. So the next morning, Ernie Duckworth and I worked on the railroad. We got together and we laughed about it. Had never thought of it, you know. Of course, I was well known for boxing and wrestling, and my name was in front of the people. So any duck says to me, look, he says, I'll run if you run. And that's how it started. Well, in, in those days, the council, you do, today you have to go and file a nomination that's paper right. with 10 that, signatures. That's but right. But they used to have nomination meetings. Meetings, in those. that's right. Can you describe what, the, what a nomination meeting was like? In 1933, when the nomination was held in the city hall, you must remember, we were in depression. We had hundreds of people on relief, how to work. There was a man in the city hall, who's the city treasurer. He had ran away with $6,000. He landed in jail. He served in jail. And uh, John Jago had been mayor for four years, longer than any other mayor up to that time. And they were tired of John. So that night, that city hall was jammed from the street up to the top. You had to fight your way in to get into the city hall. 
And that election, anyway, <laughs> I got up in there. Do you remember uh, who, who put your nomination forward? Yes, it was uh, Percy Spackman and uh, who was the other one? Percy Spackman nominated both Duckworth and I. And there was another one I've forgotten who he was now. And this was all done, this nomination meeting was in the council chamber. And the council, oh. And that, those were the days when it was a two-story council oh, chamber. Oh, yes, big, 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 uh, big council. And, uh, you know, that place was jammed, jammed from the street right up. You, could, you had to fight your way up in there. And, you know, that election was, <laughs> they swept the whole council right out. The old council would only left one man in there, and that was Angus Johnson. And Angus <laughs> Johnson... Well, he was the mayor. He was the he mayor. He was elected mayor. He was elected mayor. Four. And that council, we were all greenhorns, except Angus Johnson. And yet, you know, that was one of the best councils I ever sat on, because we spent long hours trying to find out what it was all about. We were honest, sincere, and we put in a lot of hours, you know. And then, that, as I say, that whole council was swept out. And you know, a new council elected, and Angus Johnson was the mayor. And the next year, the next election, that whole, we had established confidence in the city that they re-elected us as a whole council. Oh, right. we not, they had no, act, no election. We were given an acclamation. That was the only acclamation I think we ever got. Pete, in, in your, on your first term of council in 1930, 1934 was an interesting year, but in, in May of 1934, there was a, a city constable, Constable McGregor, who oh, yes. was, fatal, was fatally wounded. Colin uh, McGregor. And could you tell us a little bit uh, the circumstances behind uh, the, the death of this? That, that's the only police constable that's died in the line of duty in St. Thomas. I believe you're right, yes. Yes, and I knew Colin McGregor very well. What was their circumstances behind his, well, his shooting? There was two, what were their names? Father and son, Frank Temple. Temples. They stole bicycles. <laughs> They'd stolen bicycles, and they beat it out into the country. And there was quite a man hunt on. And the Temples lived on Nolan Street at one time. And I can remember Ernie Duckworth and I going down there one day, and Mrs. Temple came out, and she had the little baby in her arms. This was the boy that got up. And uh, I remember Duckworth gave her a quarter and he said, buy a pound of butter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, they moved from Nolan Street up to uh, Queen, Street. Queen Street. They stole these bicycles and uh, McEwen got wind that they were up in Queen Street. And Sam McEwen, who was a good chief of police, Although he used to take a drink now and then. But Sam McEwen uh, went up with McGregor, Colin McGregor. And Sam went in the front door and Colin went in the back door. And of course, when Colin went in, bang, somebody shot him and killed him dead, dropped him dead right there. And of course, Sam McEwen sat on the table there and talked to him. Now he said, boys, lay down that gun, he said, you're, and he tried to talk them out of it, he said, I, but they wouldn't do it, you see, and they beat them, they beat it, they caught them, of course, and they hung them, that was the last 1935, hanging. the yeah. last hanging in last the, hanging the old in the, jail yard, in the old jail yard, and you know, Charlie McClurg was the city solicitor in those days, Charlie was an awful man, uh, Gary Baker married his daughter, oh. her name is McClurg, and uh, uh, Charlie used to drink, and his face used to break all out. But he was a clever guy, so he came to me. Somebody came to me one day, and he said, you know, he said, you know, I think that Sam McEwen should have some recognition. You know, this was a brave thing, sitting on a table under a gun and trying to talk them out of it. And I said, and a dead man lying in the behind. McGregor, his mate, lying behind there, dead. And he said he sat on the edge of the table and told him that, told him now, he said, you'll get hung if you, but they, they wouldn't listen to him. So McClurg says to me, well, I says, let's go after, what, what are we going to get? 
Well, the the uh, the King George Medal. Yeah, I just I have a clipping out of your <laughs> files, and it's not dated, but it uh, it says that the King's Police Medal, yeah, awarded to law officers for outstanding bravery and yeah. police duties, and this was presented to Chief Samuel McEwen of the St. Thomas Police Report. That's right. Force. Uh, the award comes as a result of gallantry shown by the chief in his police constable days a few years ago in the Temple shooting case, and the mayor was received and presented by Mayor Peter Lang, so this would be <laughs> probably 1939. That's right, that's right. But anyway, you know, uh, who was the old judge at that time? His uh, father was Premier of Ontario, uh, uh, Judge... Ross? Ross, Ross. Duncan Ross, was it? Duncan Ross. He, <laughs> he came, you know, we had seven or eight men on the police force in those days, so we had to present this medal. So I said, you know, I said, we, Sam should get a little publicity out of this. So I said, uh, on a Saturday, we brought them up. And I think there was seven or eight policemen at that time. And uh, anyway, we lined them up, you know, and I said, now to the old Judge Ross. Now I said, you make the little speech, and I'll pin the medal on him, see? So when we got up there, old Judge Ross, he was a little fuzzy little guy, I can remember yet, with a little a gray mustache, a light mustache. He says to me, you know, I'm a poor speaker. He says, you do the speech making and I'll pin the medal on him. <laughs> I said, all right. So I made a little speech about the men in blue and all this, you know, and pinned the medal on Sam. <laughs> he got the King's Medal. <laughs> well, just while we're on the police, uh, the police force, we, everybody knows that they're located on St. Catherine Street, but they've only been there since 1971. Yeah. Where was the police uh, department located prior to 1971? The police were in the city hall. There were seven police. When I went, when I was elected in 1933, there were seven policemen and they had seven bicycles. <laughs> and there was ten firemen, seven r regulars, and three volunteers. That was the fu and we had 16,000 people in those days. Boy. 16,000 people. And, <laughs> and the police, of course, were in the basement, in the city hall. Mm -hmm. The cells were in there. And then in the Depression years, we used to string a, a piece of chicken wire across, and these transients used to come in and sleep in the back behind the cells. These were the transients that were given some food and yes. breakfast, and in the morning, they what happened? chased out. They couldn't come back for 30 days. It, they were on a circuit. <laughs> and you know, there was doctors, there was lawyers, there was millwrights, men who had had good jobs, but the depression had wiped them all out. Yes. You know? It's awful. I hope you we know, never see those days oh, again. Oh, 33. The, 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 the whole economic world came to a standstill. The banks closed in the United States the richest country in the world. And the depression, it was the greatest depression the world had ever seen. Millions, millions were, you know, around the world were caught up in this, in this depression. Yeah. And uh, so, <laughs> and of course, you know, in 33, when I went into the city hall with Ernie Duckworth, we ran and were elected and uh, Clarence McKillop was a doctor. He, uh, he headed the polls that year, and I was second. And uh, uh, Duckworth, I think, ran fourth or fifth. And the next year, I headed the polls, and McKillop, of course, a doctor, a medical man, had, you know, you had two strikes on him. But anyway, <laughs> of course, and you know, uh, McKillop came to me, you know, and he said, I don't know anything about this business. He said, if there's anything you want me to do, he said, I'll help you. He said, call on me. Do you know, a fellow came to me one time and he says, you know, there's a fellow on relief, city of St. Thomas. And he says, you know, it's a big apartment house down just between uh, Woodstock, between, what was the name of that town? And just before you get into Woodstock. Ingersoll? No, between Ingersoll and Woodstock. Uh, I forgot the name of it. So he says to me, you know, he says, this man shouldn't be on relief. So I says to Clarence McKillop, Dr. McKillop, I told him this. He says, listen, and I had a bicycle in those days. The doctor had a car. 
said, look, he said, I'll drive you down to this place, and we'll see if this guy is, that's right. So the doctor drove me down on a Wednesday afternoon. He had it off. We went down. Sure enough, this guy had this big, and he was on relief. And they said, of course, we cut him off. <laughs> Pete, also in 1934, on the 19th of June, 1934, Mitch Hepburn, who lived just south of St. Thomas on the 4th Concession of Yarmouth, right. was elected Premier of Ontario. That's right. Um, how, did you, how did you get along with Mitch Hepburn? I'm sure you must have, you know, not only as a councillor, but later as a mayor, had uh, many contacts with him. And how, how was, what was Mitch Hepburn like as a man? I was on Mitch's committee when we elected him the independent member for West Elgin when he ran. Of course, I knew Mitch well. I used to go down to Bannockburn and he had a little cabin behind there, and there was a little lake. He called it Laurier Lake. And Mitch and his wife and uh, Pete Birdsell of the Times Journal used to go down there, and we used to sit in this little cabin and, and shoot the bull, you know. And <laughs> Birdsell used to be a great writer. He used to write up these stories. And probably that's the ones you're reading there now. Could be. And, uh, Birdsell was a great writer. He wouldn't be at a meeting, and he'd call me up. He'd say, what happened at that meeting? I'd give him two or three items. Come out the next morning, you'd think he'd been there. Next day in, in the press, he was a tremendous. He died right at his desk with a heart attack. Right. Died right at his desk, you know, in the harness. Did, but, you, did know, you see a lot of Mitch Hepburn? Was he around oh, town regularly? Yes, yes. I used to go out and visit Mitch out at Bannockburn. And his wife is still alive. And I knew Mitch's uh, uh, father-in-law. What was his name? Uh, well, Mrs. Mrs. Hepburn passed away last year, this year, earlier oh, did, this year. Yeah, she, she's yes. gone. Well, um, her, her maiden name, she was a Fulton, wasn't no, she? No, no, no. Uh, Burton? Burton. Burton. John Burton. And you know, her, that was her father. And I knew John Burton well. He was a rank communist, you know. Oh, <laughs> he, he, you know, we had what we called the public forum in the YMCA. And Scott McKay and us, we organized this. And we used to bring the members of parliament in from Aylmer and West Elgin and all around. And we'd debate in this public forum, you know, up in the YMCA. And uh, <laughs> Scott McKay, he, he organized this public forum. We had all these speakers come in, you know, and, uh, and uh, they would, they would uh, you know, debate this, yes. different issues. <laughs> different issues. What what uh, what committees did you serve on on council? Uh, not uh, these are still. In the, I'm talking the 1930s prior to your election as mayor. What what committees did you serve on? I served on the relief committee. I was chairman of relief, 1933, 34, 35, 36, and 37. <laughs> and you know, we had the municipal kitchen, and we, uh, as I say, we ran that municipal kitchen and. Uh, I was chairman of relief. And then the next year, 38, I went as finance chairman. Yep. Of course, I headed the polls, you see. I was heading the polls, pulling a big vote. And see, the man that headed the polls was supposed to be the finance chairman. Yes, sim see, same way it is today. Same way as this today. So in 38, I was finance chairman. And then there was one, something happened. The first industry that we had was the Canada Vitrified Products. Out on Burwell Road. Burwell Road. And J.W. Sutherland, Fred F.W. Sutherland, and Bart Turville, who was a coal dealer, they came to me in 38, and they said, the Canada Vitrified is bankrupt. We need $45,000 to, to reestablish it. What are we going to do? And I was chairman of finance. So I went to the council. We put it a vote of the people. 45, now we spend millions and we never have a vote. But we, $45,000. And the people supported it five to one. <laughs> we carried. And, uh, the industry's so, still with us and, today. And uh, that bill came due on May the 1st. <laughs> and they never, they never failed in their commitment. Mm -hmm. They met that every May the 1st. <laughs> That's something. Peter, in, in 1936, uh, 
Miss Edra Sanders was yes. elected to the council. She's the first woman ever, ever elected to the city council. Yes, she was. Um, do you remember her? I remember her well. Her and I, that night that she was elected, I was on top, she was on top, she headed the polls, I headed the polls, and it was seesawed back and forth. And she got on. Of course, Edra was a conservative in politics. And of course, her one idea was to get into the conservative party, you see, as a member. And uh, of course, she only, she only served one year, see? And then she ran for mayor. Against Ernie Duckworth for and, mayor. Yeah. You know, silly. I said to, she came to me and asked my advice, and I said, Andra, don't, don't do it. I said, you'll never beat Duckworth. He's a strong man. Oh, don't you think so? I think so. And I said, no, no, don't do it. I said, stay for a year or two. Then I said, but she ran, and of course, Duckworth beat him. <laughs> Duckworth was a, was a good mayor, too. <laughs> well, we'll just uh, talk about, uh, you're the first mayor you served under was Angus Johnson. Angus Johnson. Can you tell us a bit about Angus yes, Johnson? Yes, Angus Johnson had a coal yard, and uh, his uh, M.B. Johnson coal. And, uh, of course, Angus, his, his, his coal business was owed a, a lot of taxes to the city of St. Thomas. And Angus just ran to protect his mother's taxes, see? Didn't want to. And, of course, the city, we'd, we would never sell these people out. But the banks would. Yes. <laughs> the banks eventually sold. But, you know, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because, <laughs> you know, there's a story there. All the coal bins in those days were uncovered. And you'd, we had the scale at the, at the market. And uh, Charlie Watling would go out and he'd pick up one of these trucks, take them into the, and weigh them on the scale to see that they didn't, and if they were under or over, you see. This was a, <laughs> and the Trades and Labor Council used to, they used to just, just, <laughs> they had, Watling and Fitz. They used to be always after the weighing of bread and coal. And there was bread in those days was un, was unwrapped. See? Mm -hmm. And of course, if it laid around, it would shrink. And uh, so Watling used to, the Trades and Labor Council, every meeting they used to come up and they'd drive, and he'd drive them nuts about weighing coal and bread. <laughs> but anyway, these coal bins were all open. Peter, I'm just going to have to we're coming up on the end of our first hour. Boy, Good. how time flies. <laughs> yeah. I'd just like to uh, thank you. This is just going to be the first, the first part, I think. We'll, we're going to sit down and, and chat for another hour, and we can easily uh, fill that up. Yeah. And just like to thank you for your time uh, for this first hour, and uh, very interesting. We've just covered your early life and just uh, <laughs> touching on your beginnings at, at Council. And I'd like to thank everybody for watching the local history program today, and we look forward to... Seeing you soon and with part two of our interview with Peter Lang. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Steve.